well and good. I uh, uh, hope everyone can be able to see my screen. I will be uh, talking about land degradation in Africa and what has the church, what is the church's role. And uh, I thank God for this opportunity. I will start by saying uh, uh, when we talk about church, it's me, it's you, you are the church. It doesn't change. So church are not buildings. So it starts with me. So we need to understand land degradation in Africa or land degradation generally. We all know it's a process uh, which the value of uh, biophysical environment is affected by uh, a combination of human induced processes acting upon the land. Well, we all know uh, God gave us this uh, uh, in Genesis when he created everything and uh, he gave us the rule, uh, he, he gave us the responsibility, go and have dominion, go and rule over everything. Go and be steward, keep what I've given you. But just because of greedy, we are yet to uh, see another responsibility given to us by God in terms of restoring his creation. Well, land is essential to our lives according to ICRAF. We grow food on it and rely on economic growth and development. In uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, approximately 83% of the people depend direct on land for survival. And well, where I come from in Uganda, we depend on agriculture and it's the backbone of the country. Going the days where in uh, my country that every region could have a cash crop that we, our parents and ancestors used uh, for us to, for our parents to study and even live and for food, for home con consumption. It is said approximately two thirds of the continent's productive land is degraded. It has lost its productive capacity to some degree. This is driven by years of overgrazing and appropriate agricultural practices, extreme weather events and con uh, conversion of forest land into farmland. The future doesn't look promising either as Africa is the only continent where deforestation and forest conversion to agriculture land is on rise. A report by uh, Agroforestry, and uh, this is one of the things that we are facing, most especially in Uganda. Uh, recently, this week, uh, we saw the uh, Ministry of Environment and NEMA, National Environment Management Authority, burning charcoal. Uh, in our country, and uh, whoever is caught has to pay penalty. Land degradation is widespread and is a result of unsustainable farming. And these are the causes of land degradation in Africa, most especially. Well, when I was going through uh, the Church of Uganda climate policy, I realized that uh, as a church, we talk about these things, and uh, one of it is a uh, uh, unsustainable farming and growing of uh, fuel wood demand, as I said earlier. The growing population pressure causes farmers to farm increasingly marginal land that is especially prone to the land degradation. The demand for fuel wood decreases vegetation coverage, which results in increased erosion. Other causes are overgrazing and soil compaction, compaction, compaction. From the Church of Uganda policy, we realize that uh, as we continue to uh, maybe uh, reach out uh, to different people and also uh, try to make sure that as we stand together in one voice, like a uniform, unison voice of uh, fighting and not fighting for environment and not letting go of what God gave us, we basically decided to make sure that it's not only the, uh, the policy itself, but also we reach out uh, by different activities in terms of discussing uh, the causes of land degradation. We also see construction of roads, uh, which is growing each and every day by the development of countries. In East Africa, we are seeing that uh, our presidents are uh, discussing about a railway uh, that is going to be connecting uh, the six countries. And we believe uh, it's one of the reasons why we also see that uh, ECOP was a challenge because it was also crossing all the countries in a way that uh, it leaves many people in a 
uh, a lot of challenges which is in line with the industri industrialization. And this has been seen in many swamps, most especially, I'll give an example uh, of my country whereby you find that most of the swamps have been given away by uh, foreigners for industrialization. And this has made a lot of waters in the city of Kampala. When it rains nowadays, some of us, when it rains, we run out of Kampala before rain stops. But because when it stops, you can't even drive a, a cut cross through. You have to wait for like three or four hours because there's a lot of uh, floods in Kampala. We know civil wars play a very big role in land degradation because uh, of producing uh, weapons. Weapons uh, are always a, a challenge to land that, for example, if a bomb is put in a certain place, growing and uh, uh, using that land will be a challenge. We need to talk about neo-colonialism, uh, which has been a challenge in many countries, where some countries uh, exchange uh, programs in terms of development, whereby one country has to bend over uh, the request of the other country to make sure that they get some uh, uh, opportunities to make sure that uh, they run a country. Well, this is a, a pictorial part of it showing what is happening in uh, different countries. So you could see uh, uh, soil erosion taking away uh, the land, which is uh, the soil, and then uh, uh, it affects a lot of uh, people. You could see that uh, uh, this gentleman was stranded looking through what asking what is next. Well, you can see a uh, deforestation which comes along with uh, agricultural uh, activities that someone is uh, sweep, sweeping away uh, the forest in terms of uh, uh, doing uh, uh, doing farming and uh, which is one of the challenges. You could see our uh, houses in form of a ghetto built in a, a swamp where water is supposed to gather and these people decided to uh, settle there, which is a challenge. And this is uh, seen in many countries. And I would like to tell you in the Diocese of Kampala, we usually do community cleaning and then we go in those slums, but you could spend one month without going there and then you find a place the way you left it. Now, it goes that back to our mindset that we need to deal with these people. You could see the fourth one, the industrialization, for example, mining and so forth, that uh, people have decided to dig. You see behind there is a forest. That shows that the forest is being degraded for uh, for terms of uh, industrialization, looking for minerals. And uh, probably it brings a lot of challenges. You could see even the people who are uh, working themselves are not well protected. So it brings a lot, a lot of challenges when it comes to their health. You could see how wastes are being a challenge to our life in terms of uh, us uh, degrad degrading uh, the spaces where we could at least use for uh, restoring God's creation or uh, biodiversity. And uh, it's a challenge that uh, uh, we continue to do the same. And when you move in the city of Kapala, you could see that uh, these, these, these uh, rubbishes end up going into the channels and that's a challenge that comes along with uh, that. Uh, well, we, as we talk about all uh, in a nutshell, we, these are one of the responsibilities uh, that I think the church is supposed to do. In 1998, uh, or oh, uh, 1998, there was a conference that happens in England where the Anglican communion uh, hosted, and this statement was made. The whole creation belongs to God. As human beings, we are part of the whole and have a responsibility to love and care for what God has entrusted to us as temporary tenants of the planet. We call to conserve its complex and fragile ecology. While, whilst organizing the need for responsible and sustainable development and pursuit of social justice. So, uh, Back then, I got this from uh, uh, the Church of Uganda uh, Climate Change Policy, and uh, I was so interested in it because it shows that uh, earlier in that day, it shows that the community was not only focusing on uh, 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 only God's uh, word, like preaching and mission and gospel, but also it preached a gospel of uh, 
caring for environment in terms of uh, creation. So, well, I could also say uh, as the Church of Uganda in response to this, we've been able to have uh, uh, the policy itself in charge in line with climate change, whereby we are able to uh, be in unison with the global Anglican community and the other Christian faith commits to commit uh, ourselves to preaching a practical gospel that dignifies or leads to dignified living for God these people through a sustainable social economic development interventions, including the protection of environment and climate change mitigation. Well, church has always been uh, in this area for over 10 years. And the key actions have included tree planting, which uh, we are looking forward to doing in terms of even planting the youth forest for camping, which uh, we are pushing so much for our bishops indoors, which is uh, still in pipeline, but you don't see it as young people. Uh, fruit trees, this has been uh, evident, well evident in uh, our churches. I want to tell you that, uh, well, where I'm serving the Anglican Diocese of Kampala, we have uh, 37 churches, and then uh, we make sure that every uh, confirmation class every year, because we have two intakes, the first intake and the second intake, they plant a tree. So that means every year, each church plants two messages both in the, one in the land church, uh, around the church, and the other one in the land that church, because we encourage churches to buy land for our agriculture practice, probably. And most especially, we can see that All Saints Cathedral has almost like 100 acres of, of pro, a tree planting project that is happening. And uh, this has enabled us to push for more that happening. Well, we also promote uh, agroforestry and use of energy saving technologies, which has been uh, something that we are training with our vicars in different churches to make sure that they can also reach out to their congregants. And also discouraging, discouraging uh, livelihood activities that undermine the clean and health environment, according to Psalms 21. So, well, as you could see, uh, I would like to say that uh, churches also are supposed to come up with a uh, such policies that can govern their congregants and also not to be put in place just to as a, a souvenir, but also to be uh, uh, reminded, uh, to be given to the congregants and then remind them that you have a responsibility. I said earlier at first or in first that uh, the church is you, it's not the building. So if the building is there without people, that what you call the church. So the church is me. So it starts with me. Uh, furthermore, uh, that due to the urgent need for environmental protection, ecclesiastical institutions around the world began promoting environmental studies to address the most colonial realities involving ethnicity, poverty, war, environmental degradation, and many other urgent matters. And uh, well, we could see uh, this happening um, uh, such a course, uh, the ecotheology course that is in place for us to get knowledge and then be equipped with it. It's one way that we are impacted to be of impact. You have information and then you have to pass it to another person. So mm -hmm. it's best to be so much of this, uh, to have so much of this information to be passed to other people. I want to say that uh, I have been able to uh, uh, create uh, a young people, uh, team of young people in the, in the Diocese of Kampala probably uh, to take lead in a climate uh, uh, action and we reach, out, we, we reach out to many people, but we are in the future, we are looking forward to having uh, a class where they can be told. As the body of Christ on earth, uh, church has to be yoked together with uh, the environmentally like-minded world institutions that are campaigning for conservation of the earth. Well, the UN, uh, UNFC, UNFCCC is doing a good work where it has even given the church. And uh, I am very sure that uh, uh, being part of the, uh, this uh, good work of the Green Anglicans, I have been able to see this, that we are partnership where we even demand for our voices, we even demand for uh, representation of uh, uh, faith-based in terms of making decisions. Because I believe 100% church is the best place where People come every Sunday without calling them, and they are trusted. We have numbers, and we are trusted. Well, if we preach this gospel unisonly, we can probably be able to uh, uh, reach as far as possible. Also, we need to network 
uh, between churches and other bodies, as I said. Churches uh, establishing environmental desks to address global problems. I would like to bring it to your attention that before I introduced myself to the environment and uh, before I, I discovered this is something that I am much interested in and my passion, I would like to thank Rachel, uh, Reverend Canon Rachel Marsh for her good work. And uh, as she introduced me to this, and when I went back within two years or one and a half years, I had to sit with the bishop and tell, them, tell him that we have the core values of the diocese and core value number nine says conserve and protect the environment, but we don't have an environmental coordinator. He said, well, let us try this and then see whether we give you this responsibility if you're taking it. And through that, I, uh, we created a desk in charge of that. And as well, it's uh, now uh, four months old, six months old. And then we are pushing to make sure that we have this and then look for different programs that can really make this as something that all diocese should copy and then put in place. And well, this is also being taken to the provincial standing committee that every church has an event coordinator, whereby we could have a body of uh, uh, the Anglican uh, uh, environment coordinators where we can sit and then plan for the entire diocese, for the entire province when it comes to the environment. So in conclusion, because uh, well, uh, good, uh, uh, before I do any other thing, I have to conclude, it's a must. Uh, this is, uh, establishes that uh, is vital to human survival. In the end, uh, the future of humanity slowly depends on how nature and humanity will fit each other. Each needs the other and must protect the other in the interest of survival. Well, if you, when I talk about the church, if you individually, everyone attending, and those who are listening somewhere, we take up the responsibility of working together with the nature. And then we do agree. We take out the greed and selfish and we put away our indifferences and we probably sit on the same round table and then we love what God gave us. Because from that start, everyone in Africa, I want to tell you that we are a religious uh, continent. I want to tell you that almost 80% or 85% in Africa we are Christians. If we take that responsibility, I believe we could make uh, this world a better place, most especially for our continent, if we probably deal with each other. Also, in your commendation, uh, that environmental stakeholders, when I talk about environmental stakeholders, you understand you're also part of it, and particularly the church take uh, on the regular education of masses, least God's people, perish for lack of knowledge. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you who are viewing and watching from uh, within uh, the continent of Africa and outside the continent of Africa. Uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to be here today. My name is Reverend Dennis Ndenge, a priest with the Anglican Church of Kenya. Uh, by the grace of God, uh, the chaplain to the Archbishop, who sends his greetings uh, to you all. Uh, today, I feel uh, really privileged to come and share with you uh, a small reflection uh, on the biblical um, theological response to land and degradation in Africa. So I'm going to bring up my slides now. Just a moment. There we are. So biblical theological response to land degradation in Africa. And uh, we are we're going to be doing a special focus on relationship between Israel, God, and the land. So one, the first thing I would like us to appreciate is that the gift of land proved the relationship between God and Israel back in the day. In the Old Testament, Israel had land to live in because God quite simply had given it to them. This gift of land made Israel realize how dependent they were on God and how dependable God was in providing for their needs, even when they were unfaithful unto him. But the question comes, when you look at the land today, when you look at our continent today, 
do you feel like it is a gift that God gave Adam, God gave the Israelites? When we look at the challenges that we have gone through, you know, like uh, here in Kenya, having gone through five years of uh, no rain, five years of drought, five years of animals dying, us not having a sufficient uh, food supply, five years of a great challenge that led to many people losing their lives and even losing their livestock as well. But nevertheless, we, we are still hopeful. So ladies and gentlemen, um, when we look at our continent uh, in Africa, uh, do we consider it to be the gift that God gave us from the beginning? Especially when we look back at the five years of drought that we have experienced as a country, the year that we had investigation of uh, uh, locusts coming in and eating the little that we had, uh, the challenge of uh, flash floods whenever I trained a little, all these things contribute um, to what we, we see today, devastation, hunger, and even death. So UNEP uh, did as a solid one back in 2015 and came up with this report that I would like to read to you that land degradation and desertification are among the world's greatest environmental challenges. It is estimated that desertification affects about 33% of the global land surface, and that over the past 40 years, erosion has removed nearly one third of the world's arable land from production. Africa is particularly vulnerable to land degradation and desertification, and is the most severely affected region Desertification affects around 45% of Africans, Africa's land area, with 55% of this area at high or very high risk of further degradation. But you know what? Our hope is still alive. There is nothing that is impossible with our God, especially our God of restoration. So, where did the rain start beating us, or rather lack of? We go back to the times uh, of, 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 of Genesis. And um, in the beginning, in the Garden of Eden, when everything was supposed to be ideal, we realized that something came and spoiled the relationship between us and God. And that was the sin of man. And it did not only affect uh, the relationship, be relationship between God and man, but also between man and uh, God and his creation, and man and the rest of creation. So indeed, the effects of sin have far-reaching consequences. Genesis chapter 3 verses 14 tells us that the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock, above all beasts of the field. The first assumption you get here is that it is not only the, the serpent that was cursed. Actually, all others were, but he was cursed a little bit more than what the others uh, got because of are his scheming ways. So you can tell that all animals fell into this uh, uh, little thing that we call the curse. In Genesis chapter 3 verse 17 also tells us that the ground was cursed because of you and me. Similarly, the nation of Israel is described throughout the Old Testament as rejecting God's purposes, turning aside from the prescribed way of life and experiencing brokenness. And as a result, the prophets tried over and over to call the nations back to God's covenant, to wake the people up to the reality of their raptured relationship with God and the consequences it was having for themselves, their land, and all of life. The cries of the prophets fell on their fears. And when you go to 2 Chronicles chapter 36, from verses 16 to 21, we are told that the people mocked God's messengers, despised his words, and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord was aroused. He brought up against them the king of the Babylonians. He carried into exile the Babylon, the remnant who escaped from, from the sword, and they became servants to him. The land enjoyed its Sabbath rest. All the time of its desolation, it rested until the 17th, the 70th year were completed in fulfillment of the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah. Thomas sounds familiar. 
back in 2020, uh, when COVID hit, we are told that uh, the world got to enjoy some seemingly uh, very clear uh, skies. Uh, here, the carbon um, emission at that point was quite little. I don't know, maybe it was God who wanted us to, at least for two years, to give it time to, to breathe a little. But I pray by the end of this presentation, we'll have gotten a clear message from God uh, about what you'd like us to do concerning restoration of his creation. So Isaiah chapter 1, verses 2 to 3, tells us that, Hear me, you heavens, listen, earth, for the Lord has spoken. I reared children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows his, its master, the donkey its owner's manger, but Israel does not know my people, do not understand. We are reminded of Deuteronomy, of the blessings and curses Moses said before the people of, uh, at, the, at the establishment of God's covenant. Creation itself as a witness to the covenant God established with Israel is called upon to testify against the people who have broken the terms of the covenant, but not only to come in as a witness, but it is also being called in as a complainant, especially when we see uh, the challenges that it has gone through so far. When we know the ideal, what it was supposed to look like, what it was supposed to be like, our relationship with the rest of creation. Micah 6 verses 1 to 2 says, listen to what the Lord says, stand up, Plead the case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. Hear, you mountains, the Lord's accusations. Listen, you everlasting foundations of the earth, for the Lord has a case against his people. He is lodging a charge against Israel. Why? Because of the way, of our wayward ways. Because of the way we live our lives. We have turned away from our Lord, and we have chosen to follow other gods. So what, what consequences have this brought along? First consequence I'd like to share is that the earth mourns. The earth mourns. The earth itself and all of its life is portrayed as suffering as a consequence of the people's sin and injustice. Consider the following texts as a small selection of the many that could be cited today. Hosea chapter 4 from verses 1 to 3 tells us, Hear the words of the Lord, you Israelites, because the Lord has a charge to bring against you who live in the land. There is no faithfulness, no love, no acknowledgement of God in the land. There is only cursing lying and murder, stealing and adultery. They break all bounds and bloodshed follows bloodshed. Because of this, the land dries or moans and all who live in it waste away. The beasts of the field, the birds in the sky and the fish, hey, the fish in the sea are wept away. I looked at the earth and it was formless and empty and at the heavens and their lights was, were gone. I looked at the mountains and they were quaking and all the hills were swaying. I looked and there were no people. Every bird in the sky had flown away. I looked and the fruit, fruitful land was a desert. All its towns lay in ruins before the Lord, before his fierce anger. This is what the Lord says. The whole land will be ruined, though I will not destroy it completely. Therefore, the earth will mourn and the heavens above grow dark because i have spoken and will not relent i have decided and will not turn back this is jeremiah chapter 4 from verses 23 to verses 28 another scripture from jeremiah chapter 9 from verses 12 to 14 tells us why is the land ruined and laid waste like a desert that no one can cross the lord said it is because they have forsaken my law which I said before them. They have not obeyed me or followed my law. Instead, they have followed the stubbornness of their hearts. They have followed the Baals as their ancestors taught them. How long will the land mourn and the grass and every field wither? Because those who live in it are wicked. 
the animals and the birds have perished. Moreover, the people are saying, he will not see what happens to us. Why? Because we think God is blind. That is in Jeremiah chapter 12, verses 4. Many shepherds will ruin my vineyard and trample down my field. They will turn my pleasant field into a desolate wasteland. It will be made a wasteland, patched and desolate before me. Or rather, it will mourn before me. The whole land will be laid waste because there is no one who cares. And the last one that I would like to share is from Isaiah chapter 24, from verses 4 to 7. That says, The earth dries up, or moans, and withers. The world languishes and withers. The heavens languish with the earth. The earth is defiled by its people. They have disobeyed the laws, violated the statutes, and broken their everlasting covenant. Therefore, a curse consumes the earth. Its people must bear the, the guilt. Therefore, earth inhabitants are burned up, and every few are left, and very few are left. The new wine dries up, and the vine withers. All the merrymakers groan. What am I trying to say in all this? In this text, as in many others, drought, diseases, ruined land, depopulation, and the death of other creatures are the consequences of human sin. In Isaiah chapter 24, verses 5, the problem is the people's breaking of the everlasting covenant, likely a reference to the Deuteronomic covenant, but also hinting at a more fundamental and universal breaking of the relationship between God, his human creatures, and the rest of creation. So indeed, you can see one of the responses is that the earth, the land itself, is groaning and mourning because of the effects of sin of mankind. But what next? What else do we see from all this? The next thing we see is that the rest of creation is also groaning. The Apostle Paul picks up on this motif in keeping with the general uh, plight of the land and the eschatological hope for new life that is already evident in Isaiah chapter 24. Paul perceives the entire creation in groaning in its current experience of subjection, futility and ruin, even as it waits for a better future. Romans chapter 8 verses 19 to 23 has been one of my favorite verses since I can remember. It says that for the creation awaits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. Right there is our ray of hope. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole of creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to this present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies, even the animals, are waiting for us to get saved and connect ourselves to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and realize our purpose in this world is to take care of what he already created and take care that we don't get to see this kind of emaciated, you know, bears in the, in, in the, in the polar side or even these uh, foxes that have uh, their heads buried in, 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 in plastic. We need to take good care of, our, of, of all of God's creation. The groaning of creation is in anticipation of something better, like the birth pangs of a woman in labor with a child. But it does not only uh, stop with the animals or the land. It also carries on a little bit further. God also weeps for creation. Jeremiah chapter 9 verse 10 tells us that I will weep and wail for the mountains and take up a lament concerning the wilderness, grasslands. They are desolate and untraveled, and the lowing of cattle is not heard. The birds have all fled, and the animals are gone. It is crucial to observe God's own attitude towards the suffering of the earth. In Jeremiah, God laments for the land that experiences the effects of his judgment on human sin. We get a glimpse of God's sorrow at the ruin of creation 
and the loss of animals. God's responses provide some guidance for our own appropriate response to the ruin of the earth. Lament and mourning over human sin and injustice, as well as over the suffering of all creation, is a necessary part of life for the people of God. Yet out of lament ought also to come repentance. Joel chapter 2 verses 12 to 13 has this to say, Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. The result of repentance will be renewed blessings for the people and the land altogether. It says in verses 18 that the Lord was jealous for his land and took pity on his people. It is in repentance that we are saved. And so what happens when we are saved? I'll tell you what happens. We respond. If the land moans, creation groans, and God himself weeps over the ruin of the earth, we surely cannot sit idly. But when we see the destruction when of creation, we must act. It remains possible for some people to ignore creation plight, to deny the reality of its groaning. There are even today Christians who are working hard to convince others that the state of the earth and its life is unimportant or of little concern to the Christian. This is a line of thought that sounds a lot like the false prophets of Jeremiah's day, who denied that anything was wrong uh, or that God would ever act to do sin. You get that in Jeremiah chapter 14, from verses 13 to 14, which says, But I said, Alas, sovereign Lord, the prophets keep telling them, You will not see the sword or suffer famine. Indeed, I will give you lasting peace in this place. Then the Lord said to me, the prophets are prophesying lies in my name. I have not sent them or appointed them or spoken to them. They are prophesying to you false visions, divinations, idolatries, and the delusions of their own minds. That speaks a lot. And it is very sobering, especially to us who have been called into this ministry to serve from the pulpit, that we need to, to let the people of God hear his voice concerning creation care. And again, we cannot afford to wear blinders that enable us to ignore the consequences of our actions. God calls us to justice and mercy. He calls us to face social and environmental challenges squarely and honestly and to work creatively to consider how, how our own lives as God's children might begin to reflect God's purpose for us and his creation. Brothers and sisters, this will be the end of my presentation. But before I go, I have a question that I would like to share with you. What might such repentance, cries for God's mercy, and a return to justice and righteousness mean in our day for ourselves as the church, our societies, and the earth itself. I pray that you may ponder on this uh, small question, and I pray that the Holy Spirit will bring you to a good conviction and help you understand where you need to go and serve. Until that time, until we meet again, go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. Amen.